Hello, this is Julie Petra, and sorry for the delay, more technical difficulties. It is time for the uh, Thursday talk. Real quick, I'll be seen on Facebook. So two weeks ago, we started to have a conversation about investing, which didn't get us very far. So sorry, hey Kim, she's joining. So we're going to talk about the basics of real estate investing. We're going to start with single family and what everybody needs to know. And I have a whiteboard here. Last time we tried to use the whiteboard, um, what do you call it, on the Zoom that did not work. So let's see if people can see this. And just keep in mind, if you miss this, it's going to be recorded in the Facebook group, no problem. Okay. Shamir, can we see the board? Uh, yes. Um, just not the far right side of it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll try this. So the first thing that people really are concerned about is, can I make money in real estate? That answer is yes and no. Yes, you can make cash coming into your household, but if you're doing it correctly, it's not really going to show up on your financial, your income statement, sorry, your tax return. It'll show up on your income statement for your business, but, oh, okay. So this is what we're going to start with, some basic numbers. Wait, we're going to talk about your rent. And that's going to be equal to your revenue. So when you're looking at an income statement, you always start with revenue. Now with rent, sometimes you have late fees, you have parking fees, you have application fees. All of those go under revenue. Is that backwards or is it is it mirrored or can you read it? I can read it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's all the money going into your business. Now, when you buy a property, there are expenses. And those are things like insurance and taxes and maintenance and legal and advertising, and I know that's going, but anyway, you have a bunch of expenses associated with this project. I'm going to erase this so as I see where my erasure is will be this one. Um, and I have a horrible eraser here, sorry. And we're going to talk about the basic income statement of a real estate property. So you're going to have your revenue. And then you're going to minus your expenses, subtract your expenses. And these are, when you look at your operating expenses, so everything that's associated with you operating that property, that is going to get you your net operating income. So what people first learn about is something called a cap rate. And your value of your property, this is the equation, your net operating income over your cap rate. Now, for a single family home, the value is determined by comparables in the area. So if you have a house, a standard realtor thing, you Look at how much the other houses sold for. You get an average dollar per square foot. If there's something special about that lot, either it's a bigger lot or the house is more newly updated or it has certain features that make it more desirable, the appraiser comes in and fixes the value for the house. Your net operating income is determined by whatever your revenues are less your expenses. So then you can determine what's your cap rate for that property. In the DFW area, we often talk about what's called a 1% deal. Okay. 
And what that means is, if you can see it, that means that your rent is equal to 1% times, now this is where people choose different numbers. It's either the value or the cost. I try to buy based on cost, not on value. But if you are looking to value your property to sell, you might advertise it as a 1% deal saying, hey, this property makes $1,000 a month. I am selling it for $100,000. It is a 1% deal. Hey, Julie. Most times when hmm? uh, I'm uh, not able to see underneath 1% deal. So whatever you have under there, you can't see it. Um, How's that? Not much better, only because the light is blocking um, what the wording is. This lighting, I covered part of it, but I'll I'll say I'll say about that. So I'll consider okay. this my lower. Okay. Sorry, I don't have an eraser handy, and I don't want to go up and get it. So let's go back to the one percent deal. Is when the rent equals 1% times either the value or the cost. So if you are buying a 1% deal, then someone is saying my house costs $100,000, the rent $1,000, therefore it's a 1% deal. If you are buying it or you have held it for a while, let's say you bought this property five years ago, and all in, and that's another concept called all in, and that equals your acquisition cost plus your rehab plus your holding. And if you finance it, plus your financing cost. And if you finance it, it's less your loan proceeds. Okay, but let's say you're not financing it for right now, and you're only into the house for $50,000 because you bought it a long time ago, and it only cost a little bit. So now, 1% of your cost is $500 a month, but if you're making $1,000, then for you, that looks like a 2% deal. If you have any questions, I can't see the chat or anything, but that's one of the guidelines that you hear, a 1% deal, and some people put that as their minimum. They want at least a 1% deal. That means rent is equal to 1% of the value because they're talking about acquiring it. The one thing that consider in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, that about 2.9% is then it go towards your taxes, and let's say about 9% is going to go against insurance. I have not tested that theory in 2022 because the prices have just gone kind of crazy. I add another 0.5% or so. So what is that? That's almost three that's for, um, what am I saying? For maintenance. This is a value and this is a rent. So point five, I actually take it up a little high. I think about one to five percent of rent I allow for maintenance. Because tenants do not take as good care of a house as you would. But if you take these two numbers, that's close to four percent. So that means that of the, of your value what that actually equates to is an 8% cap home. And I don't know if that can be seen, but I will show you how you come into that. Roughly one third of the cost of your rent is going to go into taxes, insurance, and maintenance. Rough rule of thumb. And if one third of your rent that you're being paid are going toward these operating expenses and you're not assuming any other operating expenses, that means that if you're earning 1% each month, you're earning 12% of the value a month, 
you're spending about 4% on expenses, you're realizing 8% roughly in your cap rate. That's roughly. So now what you have to decide is how are you going to value if this is a good property for you? So it depends on what you want. Sorry, I have to keep erasing. I can't use all the space. If you are going to be dependent upon the income of that property, you might have, let's see if I can, there we go. You might have a dollar amount you want. So you, you might think I want $400 a month net cash flow from this property. So that means, let's say you've got a property paying $1,200 a month in rent. So your $400 goes right off the top, and that means $800 needs to cover all your other costs. That $800 has to cover your debt service, if you have it, which is your principal and interest on your loan. It has to cover your taxes and insurance. And it has to cover your maintenance. And another thing that people do forget about is sometimes that property is empty, so it has to cover your vacancy. And vacancy expense can be separated out. You take your market rate per year times 12, and you subtract out what you actually get in gross rent. It's pretty easy to calculate. So all of those costs have to be covered in that $800 a month or that, what is that, $8,000 for $1,600 a year? No, $9,600 a year. To realize your net cash flow per month of $400. So income focus based or cash flow focused people tend to say, I want to get $400 a month. They back it into whatever the rent is less their costs and see if it works for them. So it's good to be able to figure this out before you purchase the property. 1% deals are getting harder to find in the DSW area. There are other areas outside where they're still possible, but let's say what you're actually looking for, instead of a net cash of $400 per month, you're looking for a percentage return on your money in. And that's what we call the cash on cash return. So this is a fixed number per month. Okay, so there's something called a cash on cash return. And we usually look at it in percent. So let's say you own the house, you have a loan, you bought the property, you've rehabbed it, you now have a loan, and after the loan, you have $25,000 left in the deal. So you purchased it, rehabbed it, maybe you had a hard money loan, you paid that hard money back, you refinanced into your permanent financing, you've taken into account those financing costs, and then you have net in the deal, let's say $25,000, okay? So after you've gotten your loan. And let's say what you want to make per year is 15% cash on cash. So what I'm going to do that means you're going to net, oh gosh, come on. My calculator is acting up. 37.50 per year. So 37.50 divided by 25,000, if I've done it right, is 15%. And if that's your cash on cash return um, rule of thumb, you have to make this much a year on that 25,000. Some people have higher, some people have lower. And this number is going to be your rent, less your taxes and insurance, less your debt service, less your maintenance, and less any other costs associated with that property. 
the cash you make each year is thirty-seven fifty for the twenty-five thousand that you have in it. Now, a lot of people might think, "Well, that doesn't seem like a lot of money," but it starts adding up. If you are making thirty-seven fifty a year, and you have, on average, and you have ten houses, that's thirty-seven thousand a year. Now, let's say this property is valued at the thirty-seven fifty that you're making. Let's say that property is valued, or sorry, cost, not value, cost you one hundred and twenty-five thousand a year, or one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars was the cost basis for that property. Well, you get to depreciate one twenty-seventh of that, right? So, if you take the one hundred twenty-five thousand. You get to depreciate forty six fifty six a year. So the house is valued at one hundred twenty five thousand. Straight line depreciation over twenty seven years. So that's a depreciation expense divided by twenty seven equals what did I say? Forty six fifty six. So where this becomes powerful is on your tax return. This is what's called a non cash expense. Everybody knows if you make income, on that money, you have to pay your state taxes, your federal taxes, your city taxes if you have them. And also, if you're an independent business owner, you have to pay your Social Security and your Medicare based on what your financial documents say your net income is, your gross profit after, your net profit after taxes. So now, this becomes an expense that more than covers your cash flow for the year. So you're actually showing negative on your tax return for a property that is positively cash flowing. Now, I know a lot of people do different things, but this is where I live right here. I live within the depreciation expense because I don't want to see major improvements to my income. I want to see improvements in my cash and in my equity. You have to know why you're doing these things. Let's go back to it. Forty-six fifty-six on a house that costs $125,000. That's the annual depreciation expense for 27 years. Then you take that. That then more than covers your cash-on-cash cash return. Now, if you have to add, let's say your house after 10 years needs a major remodel, you do what? It's called adjusting your cash base, cash basis. So if it was valued at $125,000 and you depreciate it per year, come on, Julie, I can use a calculator. That $46.29 a year, I'm going to say you multiply that by five years, and then you take that off your, and the reason why I can't see this is because I don't have my glasses on, so 125. That means your cost basis is now 101851 Now, you put money back into it. Let's say you have to put 30000 into it. That means your cost basis now becomes, this now becomes, because you add 30000 in renovation, because things wear out, it shouldn't be that much if you have the right tenant, but everybody's going to have that wrong tenant that costs you thirty something thousand dollars in renovation. So that means your cost after five years of depreciation is going to be back out to 131K. That is your cost basis, and then you start the depreciation again. So you want to make sure you are balancing yourself, well, at least I want to make sure that I am always living in the depreciation zone so that this money I get is tax-free, essentially. The non-cash expenses, and I'm sorry, that, that looks like the light's getting it wrong. Sorry about that. But the non-cash expenses are what help make this beautiful. There's one more thing I will add to this. If you've got debt service 
on your house and your tenants are covering your debt service, that's your principal and interest. You are building equity in that home by holding it and having someone else paying your mortgage payment. There's another backing trip that you can do, which is you refinance that home. So let me show you this. Hope everybody got this. So when you Let's say, what is it, 2022? Let's say back in 1992. And just for grins, let's assume there is no inflation and no appreciation. So in 1992, I bought a house for $100,000. I put $20,000 down, so I have a loan of $80,000. And in 2022, whoops, my loan is equal to zero. So you have no loan. Now you actually don't wait for it to go completely to zero, but is that better? Okay, good. Your loan is equal to zero. You now have $100,000 of equity in the home because the tenant has paid it for 30 years. And that's assuming you have a 30 year mortgage, preferably a 30 year fixed. So now you take that $100,000 that it's valued, we're assuming no appreciation, and you refinance. As of right now, you can get 75% loan to value on a cash out refinance. So that means you can get a loan of 75K. It's gonna cost you some money to get that loan. So let's assume you lock 5% off so you're actually getting 70% loan to value. That means you get loan proceeds of $70,000. Now let's say you have 30 houses and you stack this appropriately and every year you refinance the house, you get that $70,000. So you're just resetting the mortgage that the tenant is paying down anyway, if you're managing your property correctly. This is a non-taxable event. When you refinance a house and get cash out, that's not income, that doesn't show up on your income statement. And as of right now, it does not show up on your tax return. You pay no taxes on this whatsoever. There are other advantages for keeping your home leveraged, but just from a cash flow perspective, you now have $70,000 in your hands, no tax event, the tax event occurs when it changes ownership. So if you hold it in the right entity, and the entity is will, however your asset protection and family, um, family planning structure is, it goes to your heirs intact without a change of ownership. They can sit there and do that again too, and your heirs can and your heirs can. Now, does that happen? What I have seen is that somebody might inherit their family 100, 200 properties and they just dump them on the market. They don't care, they don't wanna deal with it, they just want the cash. I think it's short-sighted, but if you can teach your heirs, hold on to the assets that generate returns and just keep doing this over and over again. This is, if you have 30 houses and you do this once a year per house, this is 70,000 of tax-free income you have. I know everybody says, well, 70000 doesn't sound like a lot. It's a lot when you don't have to pay any taxes on it or Medicare or anything like that. That becomes quite nice. That's straight to your living expenses or traveling expenses. And let's say you have, instead of 30 houses, you have 60 houses. And they all average about the same. That's $140,000 worth of tax-free money every year. This is one of the reasons I love real estate. Last time I talked about it, we went off on owner financing and all that stuff, and I get really excited about that, too. But this is the basis for what I have done. Now, in addition, having this real estate, even if you don't re-leverage it, increases your net worth. When you start increasing your net worth, you have other advantages. And I'll talk about that in a minute. 
Are there any questions about anything that I've covered so far? We have, hey Joel, we don't have um, as many people, but this is, does this seem clear? Did I skip over anything? I'm going to go clear. through some real world examples. Go ahead, Shamir. No, so it seems clear. Okay. All right. So let's say you're not buying it. Let's say you've inherited a house. You have a house that your aunt will to you. Um, when you get that property, depending on how the ownership is transferred to you, you may or may not have to pay some taxes on the acquisition of the property. Let's say it's in bad shape. Let's just assume that it's worth, oh, with one more concept I want to talk about. That's called ARV. Let's say you buy a property that isn't in great condition and you want to get it in great condition so you can either sell it or get rent on it. And let's say you buy it for $50,000. And in order, and let's say, oh, that's ARV. So let's say the ARV of this property, which is the after repair value, let's say that's $250,000. And what that means is somebody will come in and render their opinion that once you fix this property up, it would sell on an open market with low days on market. I use 10, 10 to 20. Right now the market's crazy, but I have historically used 10 to 20. You want a quick sale that you could sell it at $250,000. Okay. Now let's say you purchase this property for $50,000. It's a piece of crap property, okay? And then let's say your rehab is $100,000. There are those properties. Where you purchase it for 50, it's worth hardly nothing. You have to put a lot of money in it, so it's $100,000. And let's say your carrying costs total are about, let's say, twenty-five. Because when you buy a highly distressed property and we have an insurance agent on, you have to purchase builder's risk, you have to pay for accruing taxes and insurance, you have to pay for holding costs such as um, electricity, water, whatever, while you're, built, while you're holding it. And if you get a loan, you have to pay a hard money loan, you have to pay for those costs as well. So let's say this is total. $175,000. This would be your all-in. It's worth two fifty. dollars so Let's say you want to get a cash-out refinance. Remember, once you already hold it, you can get 75% thereabouts. You're going to net roughly 70%. So 70% of the two fifty dollars is what? 140 plus 35. So that's 170. Ooh, right there. Did I do that right? 250 times 70% is 175. So at a 75% loan to value, that means they take the ARB times 75%. That gets you 100 and, well, the loan actually gets you a little higher, but 5% for loan proceeds, you're your loan proceeds are about 175000 This means once you refinance, your all-in is zero. You have no money in the deal. You have leverage, but no money. And then let's say it's a 1% deal, and you can actually get $2,500 a month. That $2,500 a month has to satisfy your loan payment, your taxes, your insurance, your maintenance. Let's say that comes to about, let's say $1,700 for all of that per month. So that means you have $800 a month cash flow. That cash on cash return doesn't make any sense because you're taking that $800 divided by zero. So that doesn't make any sense 
So you're doing really well. If you can structure a deal where you have no money in it, it covers your leverage, it covers your maintenance, it covers all the costs, the money that you get is, is doing very well. So from a cash on cash return standpoint, it's excellent, it goes to infinity. And from a monthly cash flow, if your one home in the DFW area that you've acquired recently is netting you about $800 a month, you're doing well. I don't have many properties like that, but you know, I love them when I get them. So now your debt service is going to depend a lot on your, your rate, interest that you're paying. The interest that you're paying is going to depend on how valuable the lender thinks that asset is and what your credit score is. Credit scores do impact the rates that you get for these loans. What some people are doing, they're getting a qualified mortgage, so they go into a house, they buy it, they live in it, and then they get the low mortgage, and they move out, and they do it again. And then they've got that low mortgage, they rent it out. And that is a strategy. It's not my strategy, but it is a strategy. Because you have to stay in that house a certain number of years. I believe it's two. That's not my strategy, so I don't know all the details. Or maybe it's at least 18 months before you can move ahead, get another qualified mortgage. That's an owner-occupied mortgage. Those are the cheapest. And then you can repeat that. So every two years, you can buy a house. But if you want to do it more then you have to use other types of financing. Any questions about this? This is what I try to do all the time. Acquire a house, fix it up, pay my carrying costs, refinance it, and have my net proceeds from my loan cover as much as my all-in as possible. And that way, I preserve working capital so I can turn around and do that again. Does everybody get that part? So we introduced ARV, that is the after repair value. So for new investors, they're often wondering, well, how do I get an, a good ARV? ARVs are a bit of an art form. It's not, there are some scientific steps you can follow. I'm sorry, that light's looking crazy. I can see it myself. So this is what I suggest you do to get a good ARV. By the way, if you're talking to wholesalers, this is not necessarily the rules that they follow. They will say we're going to comp this house within a mile and go back 500 days. And I don't know. You'll lose money listening to most wholesalers' ARV. So here are some rules of thumb, and you can do this on Zillow. I want you to stay in the neighborhood, in the development. So if the development is called, I don't know, Richmond Hill, let's say. And there are different phases. There's a phase one, phase two, phase three. And let's say you're in phase one. And phase two was built 85, 89, Phase two was built 79 to 84, and phase one was built, I don't know, 75 to 79. You really cannot compare your phase one property to the phase three property. It's not a good comparison. There's enough difference in time where the building styles, the building codes, the building materials have changed. So stop, try to stay within your phase. You want to try and think like an appraiser on this. You also are going to have different size houses. So let's say your house is 2,500 square feet, and the houses in phase one were 2,400 to 2,600. But in phase three, they were 3,000 to 3,400. And I know that's in the light that you can't see. And I can't go over anymore. I'm sorry. Well, the size of the homes are too different. So rules of thumb for ARV. 
stay in your neighborhood. They plus or minus five years of construction, if possible. You can go up to 10. All right. There are different styles of houses. Sometimes the phases change. You'll have a house that's all brick, maybe because they're all one story. And then they turn, they change to brick facade on the front, siding on the rest of it. You want to compare like to like. So try to stay with similar construction, close in years, within 90 days. In a volatile market, lots of turnover, you can find enough comps. In a slow market where there's not much turnover, it becomes harder, so you have to go further back. If you have a four-bedroom and a three-bath, you can't compare it to a two-bedroom and a two-bath. So try to stay with the same type of configuration. If you're in a phase one, and this happens a lot in DFW, where the original phase has homes where there are a lot of garage conversions. So they've taken away the garage. The house having a garage or not has to be taken into account in your comparison. How high are the ceilings? So what you're gonna do is try to find very similar houses, similar year, similar construction, similar style. Then you're gonna look at the materials that they use to renovate those homes. Do those homes have granite or formica? Do they have hardwoods or laminates? Do they have lots of uh, built-in, um, what's the word, uh, uh, recessed lighting or not? Has there been a configuration change? Have they blown out a wall or added a wall or added on? Do they have um, fresh new colors? One of the things people don't often think about is paint color makes a difference on the perceived value on your home. Because depending on, like right now, everybody wants the light, white, and fresh. Five years ago, it was the gray. So it depends on what's currently desired. And you want to try to hit that as much as possible to get your ARV, which is the value of that house selling in less than 10 days. Because the longer a house sits on the market, the longer your carrying costs are, the higher your carrying costs are going to be, the lower your profit's going to be if it's a flip, and the less your loan proceeds are going to be if it's a buy and hold. If you have a good realtor partner, ask them to not only give you an ARV, but explain to you what they're basing that on. So with a such and such finish out with this and this and that and that. So you know what target to hit in your finish out. One of the things I just saw in Frisco is there's a house, they, they have remodeled it, but they put in this quartz that I'm seeing everywhere, even in 250 to $300,000 homes, they've got this quartz everywhere on a two and a half million dollar home. I think that's a problem. So know the materials you're supposed to use. In a two and a half million dollar home, don't put the quartz that you're seeing in a two hundred fifty thousand dollar home. Put some kind of special marble. Maybe do some interesting epoxy uh, countertops with light showing up. Find out what it is that market is really supporting in sales, and you shoot for that. And a good realtor can help you with that. All right. So this gets you to ARV. That has you thinking kind of like an appraiser. If you're getting a hard money loan, they're going to give you an ARV because they're going to base your hard money loan term on that ARV and they're going to be conservative. So let's talk about how do you finance this kind of deal. Most people can't go out and get a house worth $250,000 by paying the $50,000 and having the $100,000 in cash and having the $25,000 in carrying costs. I'm not saying no one can. I'm saying most people don't do that. So they have to get funding. Uh, what happened to mine? So let's say you're looking for a hard money 
loan. That's what I'm calling a hard money loan. A lot of their fee structure looks about like this. Three points, one year term, and they'll have fees of let's say 1,000 in fees, and let's say it's 10%, and it's often more, 10% interest only. And let's say they've determined your ARV, Oh, one more thing I want to add. And let's say they're willing to go up to 70% of ARV, and they divide that by 90% of purchase and 100% of rehab. So you're probably thinking, what does all this stuff mean? What it means is, Let's say, let's go back to the house that you could buy for 50000 Can you see this? Yeah, purchase. 50000 Rehab is 100000 Sharing cost is 25000 This is rehab area. Now, you have to be kind of tricky in determining your carrying costs when getting a hard money loan because part of this number is paying back the hard money loan payment. They do not want to finance your hard money loan payment. So you might have to make that look like something else or just have enough cash for that. So with these terms, you're going to pay, let's say this says the, their ARV is 70%. Sorry. ARV equals 250K. So the 70% of ARV, what did we say that was? 175,000? Yes. So they will lend you a max of 175K. That's going to be your loan. But, 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 but they're going to charge you three points on the loan. So of that 175,000, they're going to charge you five. Point in points. So that's your loan, but they're going to take that right off the top. And then let's say you have 1,000 in fees. And I don't know how much money that's going to depend on your title company and all that. So you are, you have a loan at 175,000, right? 5.25 is taken off for the points. And then another thousand for fees. So what you actually get is 168,000 168,750. Your max proceeds. Okay. Now, remember, it's going to cost you 175,000 to repair this. So you have shortfall. <clears throat> you have to have the money to make up the difference for this. You also need to have contingency money because what if this is your budget but something goes wrong? It goes longer or there's more that you need to do. $100,000 sounds like a lot of money until you have a subclub leak that you did not put into your budget. So now you have to come up with not only shortage between this and this, which is just under $7,000, but also any contingencies in your loan or in your, in your rehab. Now there's one more thing. I said the 70% ARV, that's their max subject to additional conditions. So let's say it's 90% of purchase. Well, this home costs $50,000. So 90% of that is what? 45, right? And They'll pay $100,000 toward rehab. They don't, they're not considering carrying costs, maybe. So that's $100,000. So your loan is only $145,000. Not $775,000, $145,000. You still have to take off your points and your fees before you get, and that's what you get to work with. 
So you have to come with money to the table. I recommend either you borrow it from somebody else <clears throat> or you have it somewhere. And this is where a lot of investors get stuck because they start the process, they get the loan, they come up short. So now what you want to make sure is that you have enough money so that this loan, once you pay your points, pay your fees, that you have enough, plus your other money that you've got somewhere is enough to pay for this $175,000 it's going to cost you to buy um, rehab and hold this property, plus any contingencies. So you need backup money. Where is it coming from? Know that before you go into it. And there are lenders that offer gap financing. <clears throat> and that is, if you get into a project and you run short, they'll cover the gap. Those rates are like 30, 35%. Just boom. That's a lot. This loan is charging 10% a year they're charging you 30% maybe for seven, 10, 12 days, or something like that. It's so expensive. That's why you have to make sure you manage your cash flow when you're using third-party financing. Now, if you happen to have $200,000 sitting around, you don't have to worry about all that. You're not paying points. But if you have $200,000, you can leverage that with hard money and do this faster. Instead of doing one project, getting it refinanced, then doing the next project. You can have two or three or four going at once. You just have to make sure you have enough bandwidth for it. So hard money loans have all of these terms. Now notice the difference. 70% of ARV gets you $175,000, but the additional terms of 90% of purchase and 100% of rehab because that's going on the cost of the property, you only get 145000 less than your points and your fees. So when you're starting out, I often get the question, do you need money to invest? Well, I would think so. There are ways to get into something like this, but you have to either get your purchase price so low or your rehab so low that these don't bump up with your ARV. And people that build a relationship with lenders, once the lenders know you have experience, they will relax some of these, these requirements. But when you're first starting out with a lender, they don't know you. They're covering their butt in the event you don't know what you're doing. And there are the odd number of investors that can talk a good game, but they don't know what they're doing. So they cannot deliver. The hard money lender doesn't want to foreclose on your home. They want you to pay your points, pay your fees, pay them back. They can turn around and do that again. Because that's how they're making money, lending. You're making money flipping or renting. They're making money lending. And they will gladly do that if you show that you have a track record of being successful. Going in, paying your fees, paying your, paying your fees, paying your points. Getting it done in a short amount of time. They're like, oh, try it again. They might relax some of those terms a little bit. You do it repeatedly. They might not have these 90% of purchase, 100% of rehab um, limits. It might just be 70% 70, 70 of ARV, or they might go as high as 80% of ARV. Once you develop a relationship, then you have better terms. That takes time. Any questions on that so far? Now, to be clear, 10% a year interest only and three points, some of these hard money lenders are charging up to 15% and four points. That's a lot. 
you have to make sure you can figure out your cash flow over the, the, the project. Not just these top levels, but okay, I have this much money. I can start the project. I Oh, one more concept. You don't get all of that rehab money at once. You have to complete some of the project and then request a draw. And they will ask for receipts and then you will provide them proof that you've done the work and then they will give you the money back and then that goes in and that funds the next phase. So if you think your project's gonna last you three months, four months, make sure you have done a week by week or at least close to it analysis of your cash so that you don't go negative over the course of that project. Now, what I'm hearing a lot about these days are Airbnbs. I'm gonna run an Airbnb. I'm gonna buy a property, I'm gonna make an Airbnb. I'm gonna rent a property, I'm gonna make an Airbnb. I wanna cover that for a minute. I actually love the idea of doing Airbnbs, either way, either owning the property or, or doing what's called rental arbitrage and renting the property. And this is, which I knew what my eraser is. Sorry, guys, I'm using a clock. Next time I'll get those papers, I'll just rip it off and not have to erase. So now, you have to first determine what is going to be, oh, y'all, here's the eraser right here. That is so funny. <laughs> okay, first you have to determine what is my potential income? And they have sites where you can go and say, okay, you can charge, let's say you can charge 100 a month, 100 a night, and they anticipate a 40% occupancy. So in a month, what is that? Say 30 days, 40%, that's 12 days. So that's 1,200, uh, 12,000 a month? I can't think, 12,000, no, 1,200. Come on, help me out, 100 a month, I thought that's 1,200. That's if you have a hundred dollars a night and you have forty percent occupancy. Is that right? Forty percent of thirty days is twelve. So twelve times a hundred is twelve hundred a month. That's not a lot of money. Because you still have to pay the rent on the property, you have to pay all of the utilities, you have to pay the cost of getting the furnishings and all that you need to run that. And however, if you're renting that, then that comes off that $1,200 a month. You had better hope for somewhere near 80% occupancy. So there was a house that I had at one point. I sold it, and I'm really mad about that. And I sold it at $350,000. The rents in that area were about $2,200 at the time. When I was looking into that, I could see that I could rent that property for about 350 a night, and they expected 50% occupancy. I remember that, 60, 55, 52. So at 350 a night, 8.630 times, that's 18 days at 350, that's 6,300 a month. That's in the Airbnb business, those are your revenues. Now you gotta take off your expenses. Well, let's say somebody had rented it to me, rented it from me, and I probably would have charged a little more for a business. So let's say they're paying 2,400 a month in rent, which is income. So that leaves, what is that? Nine, 3,900 to cover your expenses, and your net um, profit, okay? So, hold on, 3,900. If 
you have the type of temperament where working in the hospitality industry works for you, this can be extremely lucrative. I know a guy that says he makes 10000 a month for property. I don't know how he does it. He has several of them. I'd love to learn. I just don't have time to do it right now. But I think he has probably 20 or 30 of these. He's doing well. And I don't think that 10000 a month is net. I think it's gross. I think it's revenue. I'm not sure. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So the thing that I will be, I will caution you about with Airbnb. If you are renting a property and you're running a business, you're carrying different insurance. You need to either have a landlord that's going to be very responsive to your maintenance needs because something's going to come up, or you're going to have to pay for the maintenance on the property. And if you want your business to run the way it should be, you need that on-call handyman. You have to purchase all of the things to make the house a business, the furniture, the towels, the sheets, the treats, the coffee maker, the, the whatever. And that's either cash or you're financing it. If you're financing it, great. It comes off your monthly, and that, that would be wonderful. But if you can't finance it, then it's cash, and that becomes cash in your deal and you're supposed to get net cash over your all-in to see if this cash-on-cash cash return is working for you. So what I recommend is choose, if you can, if you're going to start, choose an area where the vacancy is high. Those are going to be the more expensive areas. So choose that location and then if possible, either have some hospitality experience or partner with someone who has hospitality experience and then go to work on this. I know a lot of people that I have stayed in a few Airbnbs myself. Um, one of them I stayed in, this was in Chicago. It was listed as fully furnished and fully equipped. And it had one sock pan, one, one, one. How can I make a meal with one sock? <laughs> How can I make a meal with one sock pan? And in addition, this building, all of it just leaves. The foundation was horrible. Um, couldn't move because there was nothing else to go to. We were in Chicago to visit with my daughter. We weren't going to do anything but sleep in the property. And the other thing, there were three beds in that property, and two of them were uncomfortable. One saucepan, uncomfortable bed, and it didn't look clean. You know, when you've got people going in and out, not everybody is clean. So your cleaning staff has to be on point. And if they're not, you're going to get negative reviews. The negative reviews are the killer of your Airbnb business. And while I get that that's attractive, I get that you can make money from it. I'm doing different things, which is why I'm okay with sticking where I am. I don't want to, to dissuade anybody trying this. People are making lots of money. But when COVID hit, a lot of Airbnb people struggled. There are some landlords that struggled too. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about tenants. And then I think we'll be done because we're going to run out of time. This whole process works when the tenants pay their rent. <laughs> if they don't pay their rent, you don't have the revenues you're seeking. So you have to look at this as a business. This is not a philanthropy. You cannot be um, swayed by somebody's sob story. Oh, I can't pay my rent because of this. I can't pay my rent because of that. Please offer me a little bit of time. Your obligations still keep coming. And that is why I have no shame in knowing that during the height of COVID, four evictions occurred on my property. I don't care. I still have to pay my bills. That means you have to pay yours. If you don't have that, then this is not a good process for you. If you're like, well, they can't pay more. Oh, well, their son died. Their dog died. They lost their job. They're this, they're that. If you are easily swayed by that kind of story, being a landlord may not be for you because you will lose your shirt and your house. So 
and I can cover that at another time. This has been more than an hour, and I don't want to go long today. But if you have any questions, please let me know. Join my Facebook group and post your questions. You can always reach me. I hope that this was helpful as an introduction to real estate investing. I realize there's probably more to cover, but that's it for tonight. Unless you have any quick questions. Well, I thank you for attending. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.